welcome. Uh, and welcome to the Great Books Mini Lectures. Uh, along with Maureen Fitzpatrick, I'm Michael Carriger, and we want to thank you for being here and continuing to support the, the series and the program. We'd also like to thank marketing, uh, the CoLab, and video productions, as always, for their help and assistance in making this possible. And to all of the speakers we've had past, present, uh, and, and future. So thank you for coming out. Uh, to begin, Ann Daughter is uh, director of the Honors Program here at Johnson County Community College. Uh, she started with the college in 2019 and has taught Honors Forum courses on material culture and sustainability and community gardens, as well as Honors Seminar courses on the theme of absence and erasure. Uh, Ann has been a member of IMPAC, which is the Multicultural Programming and Activities Council, and participated in the Diversity Committee. She was involved in the Paper Plains Literary Festival in Lawrence, Kansas, I think both in 2020 and in 22. That's right. She earned a PhD in American Studies uh, from the University of Kansas. Her research uh, is, is quite interesting. It's at that site, that intersection of media studies, gender and sexuality studies, and cultural studies. And she looks at the translation of promotional materials for American film uh, for the Francophone world. Before moving to Kansas in 2000 to do research for her French PhD, Anne lived and studied in Strasbourg, France, where her family still resides. And whenever possible, she spends time in her hometown uh, with her aging parents and works to cultivate her own children's rudiments of French and comfort with French culture. Today's lecture is gonna cover Sarah Ahmed's On Being Included, published in 2012. Uh, that was around the time Ahn was starting her second year as assistant director in the honors program at KU. This was her first exposure to the idea that institutions of higher ed were not built to include everyone. Uh, this idea has had a profound impact on her during her formative years as a staff member and one that's helped her make sense of her professional career to date. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ahn Daughter. Thank you. I'm old fashioned, I have notes, so this is why the little podium, I guess that's unusual for this type of events where people meander. So maybe I'll meander, but I will always go back to the podium. Um, first, I'd like to um, thank you, Michael and Maureen, for inviting me to be here today um, and for the kind introduction. Things are moving. Um, and thank you all for coming. I understand that at this institution and today um, there is competition. You might want Kona Ice after um, the talk if you still have time. Um, so the way I understood my job today is um, that I need to convince you all to read, if not that book, then her books, right? Um, something by her. Um, and, and I'm going to be speaking from the heart really quite kind, candidly um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I, I trust that you're here because the title intrigued you or interested you in one way or another. And so I want to assume that my job is partly done, um, but I will still do my best, I promise, to win you over. Um, to this end, this is the sort of roadmap for um, our time together. Ooh, this is weird, I can't see. <laughs> um, we will, I will tell you a little bit about the author first. Um, then I'll move on um, to contextualize the work within the author's uh, publications. I'll position myself and tell you a little bit about how I come to her writing. And then um, I'll move on to share uh, some of the concepts that are either central to the argument that she's making or have become part of my thinking toolbox. And perhaps you can um, take some of those ideas away with you um, in the end. Um, at any given point, I am open to questions. Um, this is really not my style um, and my um, sort of ideal format, right? So as I was preparing, I wrote and rewrote and wrote again because I'm usually more of an interactive type of person. So please interrupt. Um, all right, so this person, I'll pixelate it and all because I am not tech savvy, 
um, <laughs> is Sarah Ahmed. Sarah was born of a Pakistani father and an English mother um, in the UK in 1969. Um, the family moved to Australia and she grew up in Australia. Um, and as a child and then growing into her teen years and um, early university years, she was very drawn to arts, um, but was interested in philosophy as well. Her father put the kibosh on her artistic inclination pretty early on and um, fostered the um, philosophy track. She moved to the UK ultimately um, for her PhD and has stayed there since. So Ahmed started her academic career in 1994 um, at the University of Lancaster in gender studies. In 2000 is really when she started doing diversity work. So 2000 is the moment when the UK essentially started generated legislation on um, institutionalizing um, diversity and, and making diversity a mandate. And so as the mandate trickled into um, higher learning, um, she was sucked in as a person of color, right? Um, the effort of the University of Lancaster to generate diversity policies and such. Um, and so she kept going with that work and so became sort of implicitly a diversity worker um, on top of being a gender studies professor, right, and the chair of that department ultimately for um, a decade or so. Um, and much of the work that she describes um, in on being included um, is drawn both from her own experience as well as from interviews she conducted with other people who are involved in the work of um, diversity, but I'll get back to this. Um, she moved uh, to Goldsmith University in London, um, where she became a professor of race and cultural studies um, in just about the time actually when On Being Included was published um, and um, publicly resigned from her post in 2016 um, in sort of opposition and protest, public protest, um, for the institution's failure to address sexual assault and harassment um, uh, complaints filed by graduate students. So these were formal processes that the institution was not following um, through on, and many of those students flocked to um, her vicinity. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, though not too much, um, in part because a companion um, a volume to On Being Included was published last year, and that's complaints, that was an analysis of actual complaints and what happens um, when people file complaints of various kinds, but also um, sexual in nature um, in institutions of higher education. Um, disclaimer, not much happens. <coughs> So Ahmed is now um, an independent researcher and intersectional feminist author. She has published 12 books so far. Um, she writes regularly on her blog um, called The Feminist Killjoy, highly recommend, um, and also contributes to her ex, formerly Twitter account. Um, her first trade book came out yesterday I have a copy I'll show you at the end. I'm so excited. Yesterday, yes. Um, in the US, um, it came out last spring in the UK. Um, and, and, and that's the Feminist Killjoy Handbook, right? And so it's purposefully intended for a broader audience and not necessarily a specialized um, audience. Now to contextualizing on being included. Better image, right? Um, Ahmed is by training, right, as a philosopher, a text-based researcher. Um, her first books were all contributions in broad terms, right, to postmodernism, postcolonialism, queer phenomenology, and affect theory. Um, the publication of On Being Included in 2012 marks a really stark departure from these publications in that her analysis now for the first time is not just based on scholarly publications, books or articles, right, and conversations that she may have with scholars, but they're now based in great part on the lived experience of individuals who are working side by side with her within institutions of higher education. Um, 
that is making her now a qualitative empirical researcher and that's something that's new to her. In interviews of various kinds, she will be prompt to say that that made her at first quite uncomfortable. Now she lives with those voices and she's very happy to, but we're a decade into that work, right, or more. Um, the common thread, of course, between her earlier career and the work that she published then and what she's doing now are words. And that seems sort of quaint to say, right? But um, because we're all living in the world of words, but um, she, it, for Ahmed, this, this is really quite important, actually. Um, and, and I'll turn again and again back to this, the presence of words and her relationship with words and the ways that she unpacks what words mean um, really is essential to um, what I value about her writing and, and, and really what she does um, in general. I'm going to lose my thread, so I apologize. Um, so her, s um, right, with on being included, she starts um, focusing on um, interviews and live words with um, individuals she worked side by side with. Um, she literally follows these texts around the institution. So not only the humans, right? And that sounds really um, awkward to say, but she is going to be looking at um, the origins of those documents and where the, uh, the documents end up being physically. Um, and this matters because that becomes part of what she writes about and what she analyzes as well. So um, she talks about um, the wall, um, the brick wall, right? She talks about doors, she talks about closets, she talks about cabinets where documents end up and never come out of, right? And all of this matters. So the physical experience of um, documents as well as the physical embodied experiences of individuals within the walls that we're inhabiting, all of this really is fundamental to what she is exploring. It's not just the abstract concepts, it's the you know, um, embodied experience. That's drawn directly from her phenomenological um, background, of course. Um, the literalness of this quest is reflected then in the language that she uses, um, and, and all of this is going to be um, very finely explored. As Ahmed tells the story, she stumbled or happened, this is the word she uses, on the work of diversity because she was invited to participate in the writing of the race equality policy at the University of Lancaster. Um, she was then the chair of the Department of Women's Studies. <clears throat> the Race Relations Amendment Act of 2000 was followed by a number of different legislations that made race equality a duty across all institutions in the UK. Subsequently, institutions of higher education in the UK were forced to develop policies on race equality and institutionalized work that had previously either not been done at all or maybe um, was more supportive um, of less represented minorities within institutions of higher education. Ahmed is one of the first scholars to ask the very complex question, what does diversity do? And, and this is really what she's doing in this book. So this book draws from interviews and a number of administrative documents shared with her by interviewees, both in Australia and then in the UK. The book is not about American institutions of higher education, um, though I would say that parallels may easily be drawn. All right, so now to positioning myself um, within um, her text or in relationship to her text. Um, so I come to Sarah Ahmed um, as a French, you hear my accent, it's not going away, it's been here 20 years. Um, <laughs> white, middle class, cisgendered woman. Um, on being included was not necessarily written with a reader like me in mind. Um, Ahmed consciously addresses all her mixed audiences, right? You can't anticipate who's going to be picking up your words, but she purposely does not make it easy for her readers to discern the intersected identities that make up the we she regularly points to 
um, and uses. This we could be read following national boundaries. That could be easy, but it wouldn't be accurate. Um, it could also refer to feminists, um, but it's not either what she's doing, at least not in that book. Um, Ahmed, in fact, never formally defines the we, and I think she does this on purpose. Um, instead, she draws very careful lines around what she calls communities of shared experiences, many of which I have had the privileges not to experience, but many others I've had, right? Um, and so the consequence of leaving out readers by not giving them all the tools to fully grasp an experience that isn't theirs is admittedly very unsettling. Um, one may even feel discomfort reading her. I know I have. Um, but paradoxically, this way of respecting people's varied experiences by not letting, by not letting in all the readers creates immense intimacy in those moments where you can actually recognize yourself in her words and in the text and the ways that she's describing those experiences. Um, and in those moments of intimacy, I have found the community and the support that I actually needed in that moment. Um, and so this is one of the ways in which I am fundamentally drawn to Ahmed's writing. Um, so be forewarned, if you want to read her work, Again, I remember my job is to convince you to do so. I will get there. Um, I, I, I want you to keep in mind, right, that there might be unsettling moments, that there might be moments of discomfort. Um, perhaps even moments when the more privileged among us um, may get glimpses of exclusion not experienced firsthand. Um, but <laughs> these moments of discomfort are well worth the inclusion into a community of thinkers and supports, right, um, for any and all who have spoken out um, about injustices that they have observed. And we know that the ripple effect of pointing out injustices may be a form of alienation, marginalization, exclusion. Um, any um, shape of this is accurate. Um, and, 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 and the other thing that we know too, right, as good educators know, um, is that learning, good learning, happens in discomfort or maybe comes out of discomfort, right? So I would argue that there is excellent learning to do um, in reading on being included. Um, the other way in which um, I am coming to um, Ahmed um, is is this community that she's building. And so I will describe the community. Um, the, the opportunities to learn um, extended by Ahmed throughout her, um, her writing stem from her free-flowing conversations with scholars. Uh, what makes Ahmed's writing unique is not that she should be in conversation with scholars, nor that some of these scholars may share identities with her. Um, that is the norm in academia where white men have written for, to, and about white men for decades. Um, what makes her unique, however, is the abundance and clarity of citations, as if you walked in on a conversation between friends, almost. And her language is about as simple, too. It doesn't mean that the concepts are not complex, but the language is very accessible. Ahmed does not overwhelm her reader with useless or pompous citations, she positions herself clearly and carefully within Anglo-American feminist traditions, especially queer feminist traditions. Ahmed's writing is lucid and methodical. She lets you in on her every steps and transparently draws from a gen the genealogy of authors who inform her thinking. She is super open, in other words. If she's using a concept that's not hers, she's going to tell you exactly where the concept is coming from and go back every step and explain to you, sometimes it can be a bit complex and convoluted, but explain to you what it means, right? And what it meant then and what it means to her and how it informs her thinking and what she's trying to do. That's pretty spectacular. Remember, I'm French, right? Um, the, the scholarship I had read really before I got to Ahmed, but um, before I moved um, to the US is one where without stereotyping, a whole lot of um, P 
people write using immensely complex jargon with no regard for who is going to be picking up the book and what it may mean. And while for the longest time I was a big proponent of jargon, and I still am because I understand the place of it, um, I think that opening things up and allowing people in is a factor of inclusivity. And that's something that is very central to Ahmed's project, right? So not only is she writing about what it means to be included, but she's also writing in such a way as to make you feel included in this um, history of thoughts, ultimately, in some ways, in some small ways that she's developing. It's really quite brilliant. Um, I kind of want to be her, but I'm not. Um, so Ahmed's writing, to me, is the epitome of community writing, acknowledging thinkers who came before her and to whom she considers herself to be indebted and the thinkers she is thinking with, borrowing from, modifying, or otherwise pushing against. It is common to find statements like the following in On Being Included, and I quote, my discussions of the languages of diversity is indebted to these important critiques. Not only do they provide a political horizon for my discussion, but many of the practitioners I interviewed shared this horizon. They are aware of, and in some cases, suspicious about the institutional appeal of the language of diversity." End quote. Um, because of the simplicity of her style and the clarity of her language, to me, Ahmed models inclusivity in her very writing, not only in the content that she addresses. <clears throat> she invites her readers to engage in the world of ideas in open and transparent conversations as well. And that's quite um, exciting, really. Um, the third aspect I want to focus on are queer spaces and her utilization of um, queer. Um, while she does not take, accent, take accents into consideration, and that's really only sort of a side note, um, it, it's not part of um, her salient identities, and so of course she wouldn't, right? She doesn't necessarily have an accent that's fundamentally different and that would set her apart. It's her experience, her cultural experience, coming to the UK after having grown up in Australia that makes her different. The salient identities, though, that she focuses on one book after another after another are both um, her um, person of color identities um, and the ways that that um, makes her be in the world in a certain way, as well as being an openly gay um, scholar. Um, so. I will candidly admit that I hope that someday she turns to what I share with her the most, which is being in this liminal space between countries, because when you're an expat, you're never ever um, part of anything, right? You're sort of always floating in between. It's not a bad thing, Maureen, it's okay. We live it well. Um, well, some of us do anyway, I think. But, um, so maybe someday she'll write about this, I don't know, um, probably not. Um, th that said, on being included is, is very personal, right? Um, as Ahmed really focuses and draws from these two salient identities. Um, it's not quite as personal as the companion volume that was published last year that's really, really personal and, and really quite fascinating. Um, harder to read in some ways. Um, but her empirical study and the many ways in which institutions of higher education um, generate policies, choose to invest in certain initiatives and not others, and generally elect to look right over doing right by all people, is rooted in what she observed firsthand while she was a diversity worker herself um, with her intersected identities and what all that means. Her analysis has provided me then with a framework to understand the systematic nature of inclusion and the keys to unlock doors that probably otherwise would not even have seen. Um, and to ensure that in my own work and scholarship, I am mindful to address inclusion spatially, directionally, and effectively. I have found her use of the, noture, the notion sorry, of queer spaces uniquely helpful um, to define, um, sorry, not um, because it describes or promotes in any way um, a sexual identity or orientation, 
but because she is careful to define queer spaces as odd, always already um, other, and therefore places of creativity because misfits find themselves there. Forced to create meaning and comfort where the institution does not do the work for them. Um, so I have recognized myself in those queer spaces um, and, and, and I have done so personally, certainly, professionally as well and, and academically. Um, so it, I, I find those queer spaces and the way that she mm. describes them, right, as ultimately generative of um, immense creativity because of what they are and who finds their, themselves there. And in many ways, although that might be something that is um, perhaps unorthodox, I think that honors um, finds itself um, in that space um, quite well as well. So in the remainder of my talk, um, I will go over key terms, as I said at the onset, that Ahmed uses to make sense of the work of diversity in higher, ed higher education, institutions of higher education. Many of these words or expressions um, have taken a life of their own, and so you may recognize some of them. Some of them also are just so simple and sort of pedestrian that you may wonder why it's even a thing, right? Um, and so that's in part why they matter. There are seven of them. Um, much of the language, again, is quite simple, um, but that does not make the concepts easy to grasp. So I, I will do my best to explain what they mean, um, and to reposition them in some degree of genealogy, though I don't do it necessarily for every single one of them. I do it mainly for one of them. Um, and more to the point, I have selected concepts um, that I live with and that have been helpful to me in understanding um, the world I, I live in and the world I work in. Um, and so a whole lot of that um, hopefully is going to be clear, but I trust that you will tell me if I'm not. And so feel free, again, second invitation to stop me if you have questions. I don't even know that that's allowed, but you know. Okay, so my thinking toolbox. The first concept that I find really particular inter particularly interesting and that she explores at length and really uses um, a lot is, is the institutional plumber. Um, the people she interviewed for On Being Included, as I said many times now, are diversity workers. Ahmed describes them, and I quote, as institutional plumbers, the ones who point out what is being blocked to point out what is blocked is to be experienced as the blockage point, as the ones who are getting in the way of the flow, end quote. Um, on the basis of the interviews she conducted and documents she analyzed, Ahmed concludes that higher education employees doing diversity work or who work to promote diversity do work similar to what plumbers do because they identify blockages. So far, so good, right? Um, but she goes further, contrary to plumbers who then work to undo the blockage once they find where it's located, diversity workers in higher education are not equipped with the tools nor resourced in such a way that they could undo the blockage. Um, instead, in the process of pointing out blockages or problems of various kinds that individuals may encounter or that otherwise may um, impede the institution's well-functioning for all people, institutional plumbers end up being seen as the problem. This is an institutional problem um, in my mind and one that I have observed firsthand um, a number of ways and perhaps many of you have as well, right? We may observe some of those um, instances in very small or in very bigger or in much bigger ways. Um, it is very often what stops people from interrupting the flow or a conversation, from not laughing at a sexist or otherwise bigoted joke, um, essentially from stepping in um, and interrupting um, what, uh, what, what is being done. Um, 
you're, when you're doing that, you might be at risk of not fitting in, um, of being seen as a misfit, and that is risk taking that many people um, are not feeling able to do, right? Um, or um, willing to do. Um, the killjoy, which I will define next, um, is the person who does that, who is not afraid of stepping forward and actually interrupting the flow and the general happiness around. Um, the feminist killjoy, and this is why I took this definition from the promise of happiness, which was published in 2010, um, and not from on being included, because admittedly, and on being included, she does not do a very good job of actually defining the killjoy. But um, so while the feminist killjoy did not originate in on being included, it is present in the book, since many killjoys, as we know, walk the hallways of institutions of higher education. Um, the killjoy asks hard questions, refuses to laugh at jokes that are meant to demean, put down, or otherwise discriminate, and general, generally will interrupt institutional discourses that obfuscate injustices. In the process of challenging the status quo, the killjoy also contributes to making space for people for whom the institution was not created. The killjoy was born in Ahmed's analysis of happiness and the ways in which um, happiness has been used to maintain the status quo. Um, she devotes one full chapter to the killjoy in the promise of happiness, and I'm happy to say that the entire handbook that was released yesterday is devoted to the killjoy. I can't wait. Um, I promise I don't get money from advertising. <laughs> I don't. Um, so if achieving happiness requires that we all follow the same prescribed path and engage in the same narrative, happily ever after, yes, um, it is quite clear that many of us will not fit in, that we will be misfits. The killjoy then is the one who is not afraid of stepping forward to interrupt the collective happiness if such a discourse precludes justice and inclusion. Um, now, logically, institutional happiness, what the hell is this? Um, institutions of higher education, like any other institution or group or society for that matter, is invested in maintaining a happy narrative that demonstrates their productivity, their contribution, their positive impact in general. So we're very focused on right, maintaining an appearance, what one might say. Um, Ahmed calls such affirmative discourses institutional happiness. They may appear in statements, in photos, in statistics, in um, satisfaction surveys, any and all of these may sound familiar. Maybe you've seen them, maybe you've produced them, um, right? We participate in many more forms or utterances. We all like to do the right thing and contribute to the success of the institution from the classroom to our various positions and roles uh, within the institution. That's the way the system works. It doesn't make you a bad person, um, it, it's normal. Um, doesn't make us a bad person, I guess, all of us. Um, but who falls off this cohesive whole in the process, right? What is the cost of fostering uniform happiness narratives? Ahmed forces us to look at the process and, and acknowledge that, and I quote, preserving an idea of the institution as happy can involve an active turning away or even keeping away from those who might compromise this idea of happiness. To bring a problem to institutional attention can mean becoming the problem you bring. Becoming what gets in the way of institutional happiness." End quote. The maintenance of the image of happiness may require that the institution engage in speech acts, utterances, statements that affirm that discourse even if perhaps, and, and perhaps especially when the sentiment is not unanimous and some questions or problems go silent. In the process of writing this talk, I will be entirely candid, I stopped to consider um, if I was not also contributing to institutional happiness. I have to, right? 
what would I be doing here if I were fostering unhappiness? Would you all be leaving and, and taking off? You probably might. I mean, again, Kona Ice, right? <laughs> Super competition. And yet, to remain faithful to ha Ahmed um, and her line of arguments, I asked friends, um, people of color, all academics um, and, and white folks, um, to, to tell me what my talk was doing um, and whether I was heading in the right direction. Um, I did rewrite, rewrite parts of this talk a few times, um, perhaps because I was super nervous, I still am, um, but, but also because I was keenly aware of the tension between what I was doing, trying to make people happy and foster a sense of, um, a sense of comfort, um, facing a book that actually is trying to interrupt that discourse. Um, they assured me that I was heading in the right direction. Whoa, I have no idea what that means. So I'm sure that in the, at the end, right, when we have time to exchange, you'll tell me whether I hit the spot or not. Um, I guess the gauge is how uncomfortable I'm making you feel. Um, okay, so non-performative is um, the, probably the headiest of all the concepts that I will address, um, but one that I find really interesting because, because of the complexity and the time that she takes to painstakingly explain um, how it's helpful to her and what it means. Um, and so I'll try to do my best um, to do so as well and do justice to her and to the people who came before her, who she's citing. So in the process of following diversity workers and the institutional responses to the Race Relations Amendment Act of 2000, Ahmed points out that diversity workers often find their work limited by the institution's elastic definition of the term diversity, one that would not upset the status quo and challenge the institutional notion of happiness. Diversity workers thus end up being busier, producing words and showing that the institution checks the boxes of diversity rather than actually doing the work that would affect change, but might create discomfort. In so doing, Ahmed questions the relationship between an utterance or statements or discourses, right, the words produced, and the acts <coughs> or acts, actions, that these words are meant to describe or accompany. So we have two entities here, right? Ahmed goes all the way back to the introduction of the idea of speech act as performative utterances codified in 1975 by John Austin and how to do things with words. This original understanding of speech acts is positive for an utterance to have a positive or happy outcome the intention, act, and speech all must be aligned. For instance, I may claim that I contribute to fostering um, inclusion at JCCC by the work that I do in the honors program. Mean it and do it, right? That's a positive outcome according to um, Austin. The alternative would be unhappy, right? If one of those came to miss. Judith Butler, um, in Gender Trouble in 1993, um, will make this idea a little bit more complex, right? Where she describes the necessary reiterative and citational aspect of speech acts for them to become meaningful. For Butler, meaning emerges from the repetition of statements um, and the ways they are made and the actions accompanying them. So it's this redundancy that eventually is going to create uh, what is, as far as she's concerned. So if I want to proceed with my example, um, my claim of fostering inclusivity to be true, not only will need to be said, but it will have to be repeated and I will have to be developing a um, network of different documents that exemplify um, that statement. So a discourse of sorts, right? Um, that demonstrate that the honors program indeed is fostering inclusivity at JCCC. And then not only that, but I will have to do it. Um, so I will have to say it, and I will have to repeat it, and I will have to live it. What Ahmed does with the, con the concept of um, performativity 
is create the non-performative because what she observed interviewing um, diversity workers but also doing the work of diversity in higher education um, is that what people say they do is not what actually happens. Um, and so she builds on and modifies Butler's use to introduce the non-performative speech act as a practice of naming that takes the place of doing. Um, as she describes them, then diversity workers end up producing words in policies, posters, letters, you name it, that will look like the institution is doing what it said it is doing, but without giving itself the means to actually do it. Um, in my own example, I guess, um, if I want to follow that logic, though that's not what is happening, um, my claiming to foster inclusivity and honors may be non-performative if I were to only just say it and do nothing about it. All right, so a few more. Bear with me, don't fall asleep quite yet. Okay, institutional passing, the concept clearly draws from race, but it's not necessarily about race. Institutional passing in um, the way Ahmed is using it references directly this idea um, that we try to erase difference and make everything and everyone uniform. Um, we will do so in a number of different ways, right? Things that are seen, photographs, posters, etc., statements that we're making. Um, there's an us that may sometimes obfuscate the cracks that actually exist um, and do so on purpose. This is what institutional passing um, really is about. Um, and I'm wanting conversation, so I'm going to go fast. I'm sorry. Um, whiteness. I like whiteness. I, I wrote about whiteness. I mean, my work is about representations of, um, uh, of teen, teens in the U.S. and how they're perceived abroad, right? And so I'm interested in um, the predominant whiteness and the gender in these identities. So I've been sort of um, in awe of the ways that it creeps up in very many places, whether it's articulated or not. Um, but I'd, as this quote, this is the longest quote that I have on my slides, I apologize, it's so long. Um, as it suggests, the main characteristic of whiteness is that it's invisible and it's ubiquitous. Um, so to notice it and the norms that it fosters, one has either to be entirely outside of it or um, to intentionally distance oneself from it and the privileges some might derive from it. So it's a risk, again, there's risk taking in taking distance from the whiteness if one even manages to see it and to <coughs> identify how one can take steps away from it. Um, I'll use one example that Ahmed um, specifically unpacks in On Being Included, and she warns us, for instance, um, of the many ways in which whiteness is reaffirmed even as we're working to promote diversity. So for instance, by um, praising the anti-racist, we're recentering whiteness as opposed to focusing on the person who has been the victim of racism. That can be applied in all sorts of um, different concepts, but this is something that happens over and over and allows for whiteness to remain in its place unchallenged, um, even when we're saying that we're doing the work. <coughs> the image of the brick wall, no words here. Um, <coughs> sorry. I knew that you could not imagine a brick wall, and this is why I took a photo. Right. Uh, and so the, the brick wall is really everywhere in, um, in on being included. Um, as Ahmed follows diversity workers and describes the paradox of explicitly institutionalizing diversity whilst preventing diversity workers from ever being fully integrated in institutional life, she finds them repeating again and again and again um, that the work of diversity to them is akin to banging their head against a brick wall. And she actually uses this expression as, you know, it's banging your head against a brick wall, hyphen, 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 job, 
like that that's sort of the way that diversity workers who don't know one another work at different institutions on two different continents in different countries are going to be describing the work of diversity work in higher education the expression is both metaphorical and literal right because institutions are keen on preventing work from being done when it's not in the best interest of this appearance that it's fostering. So it's going to be um, promoting the building up and the coming up of brick walls that um, uh, diversity workers find themselves banging against time and again and again. Um, an ultimate paradox highlighted by Ahmed's work using focusing on um, the brick wall is that, and I quote, diversity practitioners not only come up against the, the wall, they are often themselves encountered as the wall, as obstructing the movement of others. So again, we get back to some of the concept that I explained earlier, right? When you point out problems, you find yourself being taken for the problem. And so even though you're pointing to a wall, you become the wall. Um, in the worst cases, um, individuals are removed because, well, we understand why. Um, as diversity workers and others point out problems, they come to be seen as the problem in, ultimate, in an ultimate positive twist. Um, and this is a little bit of a sharp term, so bear with me. Um, on the brick wall, Ahmed concludes on being included with the metaphor of the brick wall to suggest that diversity workers attempt to, and I quote, transform the wall into a table, turning the tangible object of institutional resistance into a tangible platform of insti for institutional action, end quote. The centrality of community of exchange of ideas is the thread that runs through on being included, the way it is written um, from the way it's written to the very topic that it addresses. It's thus fitting that she may close the book on such a positive note, even though I'm going to be a bit more positive than she actually is, right? So she sort of implies that um, you need to be continuing to talk to people even though you may not agree and ideally bringing folks around the table is the way to start that conversation, hence her move from the brick wall that opposes to the horizontal brick wall that may turn into a table, right, and forms an opportunity. She is not nearly as positive as I am though. Um, so she's just opening the door but like cracking it open really more so. Okay, so my talk and the sort of, so this is, th these are literally, don't look over it, don't look over it if you can't get over it, is the way she finishes the book. Um, sorry, I ruined it for you, this is it. Uh, but um, though my, my statements did not really lead up to a formal conclusion, I just want to briefly make a couple more, uh, share a couple more thoughts um, uh, along those lines, kind of. Um, the first one um, is that you may have noticed, and especially students, um, there's one of you here who took my seminar, whoa. Um, but I like absence, I, I think about what's not there all the time. What I did throughout my talk, there might be one instance where I use diversity as a noun, but for the most part, it's always paired up um, knowingly with diversity workers, so it's, a, it's an adjective instead. Um, and I do that on purpose. There's several reasons. One of them is Ahmed herself is discounting the word, the word diversity because of um, how much it's stretched and therefore how much it has lost in meaning and power. The point that I want to make though is that in this moment where we are right now in the US where the concept of diversity is being challenged by legislatures across the country um, that are preventing um, educators from using it, right? Um, it, it's really quite interesting to be thinking about Ahmed in 2012, thinking that diversity was already gutting an effort to promote justice and equity instead, which were the concepts that came before. Right, so in the genealogy of concepts, you don't know where we're headed, but it's kind of scary and it's more than words. Um, 
The second thing that I want to reemphasize, though I've talked about it before, is that Ahmed, though she's neither the easiest nor the most comforting person you will ever read, um, is really well worth it, I promise. Um, not only because she's probably going to give you one of the richest and generous um, experience that you've ever had reading, um, but also because you won't sit quietly thereafter. You can't. You'll be angry. You will embrace some of the anger that suffuses much of the writing through other authors. Um, and I think that anger is healthy. But of course, I'm French. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think that um, finding community, um, finding some degree of comfort in the discomfort um, is what I challenge you all to embrace and um, pick up the book. Um, if nothing else, OK, I ended my talk with some kind of a joke, and I was not going to do it, but now maybe I'm going to do it. So right now, right, um, because you've survived these 30-some minutes together, you've survived my talk, you've survived me, that gives you all um, a shared experience. Yes, and so I'm hopeful that this shared experience will generate um, conversations and exchanges, if not right here and now, maybe in weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you, Aunt. Uh, I know some of us have one o'clock obligations, but we have maybe time for one or two questions. Anyone? I missed the name of, there were some books you were mentioning. You miss, mentioned a book by Judith Butler. What was the title oh, of that? Oh, it was Gender Trouble. Okay, and these both, that and the um, how to do things with words, um, does Ahmed agree with them or does she just move forward from them? She moves forward from him. Um, yeah, she really is more engaged with Butler than she is with Austin, but she goes all the way back to Austin well, maybe because Butler is arguably a little dense, right? And I think needs to be unpacked and needs a little bit of help um, to make sense. But yeah, I, I mean, I don't think that she disagrees with either of them. Um, I think that um, her creation and proposition that's non-performative is a thing, is kind of in jest. She's pushing their uh, notion of performative to the next and sort of almost absurd um, that step. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so she fully embraces it. Uh -huh. It seems really logical, though. I mean, yeah. I know it's funny, but it's also like, yes, we are doing things with words, but we're not really doing those things. We're just using the words. So, right, that's I mean, exactly I, right. I, I yep. see that. Yeah, emptiness, right? I was intrigued by um, the phrase institutional passing, yeah. um, minimizing difference. Why passing? Is she implying death, or what's the meaning? Oh, no. So um, in the people of color uh, who sometimes have a lighter skin tone, um, I mean, throughout history, really, have been said to pass if they can essentially adopt enough of the um, the white performative aspects, right. Um, right? So yeah. this is the reference. I was thinking yeah. Say no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's pretending. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned like the word diversity getting like really stretched out and yeah. overused. Um, do you find that the author? regularly like tries to bring in different words or that they try and give meaning to those stretched out words? So diversity is really the only word that she puts down um, and that she says is um, just rinsed out of any meaning because it's been used so often and to mean so many different things. Um, otherwise, no, she has, a, she has a very circular, no, spiraling way of writing wherein she's going to be repeating statements in different ways to be unpacking what words mean to the fullest extent. And essentially, it's, it's after a few pages of trying to figure out what diversity may mean that she comes to that conclusion where, well, after all, 
this may not be a helpful or useful word, right? So it's kind of one of those. Um, in The Promise of Happiness, she cites a scholar who actually, in essence, says um, using jargon is being lazy and not thinking. So um, she is, she's one of those people who's going to be very keen to explore a word even until it's tired, right? So she really tries to turn it in all the ways to see what it can mean and how it can be helpful. Yeah, I kind of like that, actually. Yeah, thank you. Am I answering your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Time for maybe one more. I know you haven't had a chance to read it since it just came out yesterday, but do you know what the impetus was to turn to a more general audience if it came from her or from her publisher? Um, no, I don't actually. I haven't read anything about um, where the impetus comes from. Um, I just read the first few pages um, last night. Uh, I think on the basis of my reading of the first few pages, um, she is interested in broadening her audience. So she is fully understanding that um, being published by Duke University is going to mean that mostly people in academe are picking you up and that that presents limitations. Um, that also, I assume, implies that she recognizes that feminist killjoys are many and can be found <laughs> in all sorts of other places and not just running the hallways of higher education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it reads, um, it's simpler. In fact, I resisted the urge to change, you know, some things in the talk again. Um, but in the first few pages, she actually opens things up and includes, I bet, most of us in the killjoy now, right? Because she sees the killjoy and defines the killjoy more formally now. So this we as people who essentially interrupt happiness. 